So welcome everyone to an introduction to programming with Sickle uh, on Perlmutter and beyond. Um, we're really excited to, to offer this training event um, and to host, uh, host Codeplay, who's, who's really an expert on, in Sickle, um, to, to help, help us learn more about this programming model. Um, so I, I'm Brandon Cook. I, I work at NERSC in the Application Performance Group. Um, Amanda Dufek is, is also in the same team. Um, and then Helen is, is here from our user engagement group. And then from Codeplay, we have um, Hugh, who's gonna lead the, the training from, from their side. So um, yeah, and, and Gordon Brown and, and Rod Burns are going to be here to, to assist as well. Um, so yeah, some, some basic logistics. Um, so make sure that you are, are muted when you think you are, um, you know, mute when you join. Um, I think you might be muted by default if you join. So if you are attempting to speak and no one's responding, um, please check that you are off mute. Um, also, we ask that you please rename your, your name in your Zoom session. Um, the instructions are here on the screen. Um, and this, this really, it will allow us to streamline helping, helping you out if there's any, any kind of support question that, that comes up during the course of the, the training event. Um, so as you've probably seen from the, the pop-up, um, you know, live transcription and um, full view of the transcript are enabled and we are recording this. So if, if you do not wish to be recorded, um, this is your, your notification um, or reminder to keep your, your video and audio off if you want to just listen. Um, please ask your questions in the general channel in Slack. Um, this is preferred instead of the, the Zoom chat. Um, here's the link to, to join that channel. And this link should also have been provided to you via your e the email invite for this event. Um, and I guess, as I mentioned, the slides and videos from this will be made available after, after the event's over. So. Um, if there's if there's a if you want to reference this content later, it's going to be available. Um, there will be a hands-on component, so please um, find you can find this in this uh, repository on GitHub. Um, and uh, finally, I'd like to say I invite you all to please answer. The, the following survey that's linked here. Um, I'll put the links uh, into the chat momentarily after I'm done sharing the screen. Um, answering this survey really helps us improve these events for, for everyone. Okay, so using Perlmutter, um, all, if you're already a NERSC user, you will have been added to the NTRAIN1 project. Um, if you have a training account, those expire on March 8th. Um, we have a reservation for some compute nodes on Perlmutter. Um, that is from 9 to 3 p.m. US Pacific time. Um, in order to access that reservation, please add the, the following directives to any batch script that you're using. Um, I think I'll also call out that um, you know, due to the limited number of nodes available, um, please prefer to use the, the batch system as opposed to allocating nodes interactively um, within the reservation. And um, you, if you're in the training account, you can also access the regular Perlmutter nodes um, just with the same account. Um, and then if you go to docs.nurse.gov slash systems slash Perlmutter, this will um, 
this is the, the sort of landing page to start off with any, any Perlmutter specific documentation. And um, I think we're gonna we're gonna cover this again in more detail. And there will be, um, you know, I think the slides have been posted in the chat, but we'll we'll also um, we don't expect you to copy, <laughs> write, rewrite these commands down. Um, but CodePlay has prepared a, a module for us to use with the compiler. Um, and uh, we'll we'll get into to actually using it in the hands-on portion. Um, I guess I, I'll also state at this point that this compiler is not um, that it's not using open uh, MPI at the moment. So um, we're we're focusing on the kind of on node programming model at this time. But uh, if you do have a need to mix in MPI, um, I'd invite you to um, please send me a message via via Slack, and um, I'll see if we can if I can figure out a way to accommodate that for your application. Um, okay, so finally the schedule. Um, we're going to start with the introduction um, and then discussing about how to actually get some work scheduled on the on the uh, GPUs. We'll have a few short breaks. Um, and then we will have uh, some discussion on profiling and debugging and then an open question and answer session followed by uh, the end of the event. Um, and so with, with that, uh, thanks everyone for attending and I'll stop sharing and hand it over to you, Hugh. Yeah, so welcome everyone. Yeah, um, thanks for joining. Um, so my name's Hugh, I, I'm a software engineer working at CodePlay. And uh, yeah, we're gonna be looking at some kind of basic uh, features of the language and hopefully covering as much ground as possible in this short window. Um, so we have lots of uh, materials available online. So this will kind of be a jumping off point into the language, but also using the language in uh, yeah, kind of like serious way. So yeah, without further ado, and if anyone has questions, please interrupt me at any time. Um, you can you can use a Slack. You can you can uh, use the um, the chat in the Zoom. But I think the most reliable way is maybe just to to interrupt me. So please feel free to interrupt me because um, everyone has questions all the time. And if we ask these questions then everyone gains from it. So definitely please ask questions. Okay. So yeah, let's get stuck in. Okay, so what is SICL? Uh, so this, this uh, introductory chapter will um, give us an introduction to SICL and also in, um, to the compiler that we're going to be using on Perlmutter. Um, Okay, so the learning objectives for this um, module. So we're gonna learn about this SQL spec and its implementations, learn about the components of a SQL uh, implementation, learn about how a SQL source file is compiled and where to find useful resources. So we're kind of gonna be glossing over uh, details about implementations in general and focusing more on the uh, DBC++, which is the Intel One API implementation. Uh, with the CUDA backend especially. So SICL is a single source, high level standard C++ programming model that can target a range of heterogeneous platforms. So we're gonna be repeating this and going through the elements. So I won't uh, try and take all this in at once. Okay, so a first example of SICL code. So this is just what SICL looks like in the wild. Um, so you can see, I'm not sure if uh, people can see my, my mouse. Yes, we can see them. Yes, up. good. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so um, yeah, essentially we're constructing a, a queue. This is associated to some device. So this is kind of you know uh, some kind of um, unit of work that's like a, a list of things to be done. Um, we'll we'll go through this uh, um, in in more detail later. So maybe uh, don't try and remember that too hard. Uh, we malloc some some memory, uh, then we do something, we, sorry, we initialize, then we do some, some kernel code. So this is essentially a, a SQL, um, yeah, SQL code. You'll notice that we have, so this parallel four, which is kernel code, this is uh, within your normal C++ file. So this is 
uh, a core aspect of SICL, uh, as we'll see. So SICL extends C++ in two key ways. So device discovery and information. So we can find out about what um, devices are available, what uh, devices we can choose, you know, heuristics for prioritize this device over that device, uh, device control. So dispatching work to a particular device and, and so on. So SICL is modern C++. So SICL is essentially built on C++ modern things like uh, templates and lambdas and that kind of thing. So if you like templates, you like lambdas and you use them a lot, then you'll like SICL. Um, yeah, so SICL is open source, multi-vendor, multi-architecture. Okay, so SICL is single source, uh, high level standard C++ programming model that can target a range of heterogeneous platforms. So emphasis on the single source. So uh, within the same file, we have host code, uh, CPU code, and the device code. So um, code that's supposed to, uh, code that we want to target, say, you know, a, a GPU or some, some other offloading device. Uh, so we have kind of parallel host compiler, device compiler, which are then linked together to make uh, a bundled executable. Um, we'll go through this a few more times. Um, so as the main idea is that there are two separate compilers. You have your device compiler and also your, your host compiler. There are many kind of compilation processes. So um, we don't need to get too bogged down on that. I'm gonna be speaking in a second about the, the CUDA specific uh, compilation model for DPC++. Uh, high level, okay, so uh, SICL is a high level language. It's based on uh, modern C++ and it's, um, it, it doesn't add any, any uh, language features that aren't already in the language. Um, high level abstractions over common boilerplate code, which is a great thing if we're used to dealing with things like maybe OpenCL or uh, more low level um, kind of APIs. Uh, so it gives us a high level abstraction over common boilerplate code for device selection, platform selection, uh, kernel function compilation, <coughs> and dependency management and scheduling. This is something that's quite natural in SQL. The API really allows us to do this quite elegantly. So this is, this is one of the great things about using SQL in my opinion. Uh, standard C++, so uh, SQL doesn't add any language features that aren't already in the language. Uh, they're implemented in the back end in you know, particular ways by an implementation, but they're just normal language features that use things like lambdas and templates to write kernel code, unlike things like CUDA, OpenCL, um, you know, other, uh, uh, there are no pragmas like in OpenMP, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, and we can target a range of heterogeneous platforms. So this is another really great thing about SQL. We can take the exact same code and it can run on um, as many backends as are supported essentially, unless we're doing very, very specific things particular to some, maybe CUDA specific to some particular hardware. But in theory, uh, we can target CPU, GPU, uh, APU, Accelerator, FPGA, uh, DSP. We can we can target loads and loads of things. Um, so this is a really yeah. There's a, a good thing about SQL, definitely uh, the interchangeability of what we're actually offloading to. So the SQL spec. Uh, the first version of SQL was SQL 1.2. Uh, we're currently on SQL 2020. Um, so this this uh, the spec has been defined and. The implementations are, um, they're, they're almost fully uh, implemented SQL 2020. None of them have completely finished implementing the, the spec, but we're pretty close to done. Um, in terms of daily use, it's, you know, it's, you wouldn't know that the entire spec isn't uh, implemented. It's, you know, very workable, useful. <coughs> so here are an overview of, um, some implementations we're going to be focusing on one API, uh, DPC++, particular with, particularly with the, uh, the CUDA backend. Uh, Codeplay also has its own SQL compiler called Compute CPP. Um, but yeah, we're going to be focusing on this one. Okay, so what a SQL implementation looks like. So 
the Sickle interface is a C++ template library that developers can use to access the features of Sickle. So this is this kind of box here. This box should be highlighted. This box here. So the language is it kind of is used uh, in C++ just through templates, um, through just standard C++ features. So this uh, it looks like just normal code, um, like you're using a, a normal library. Um, so the same interface is used for both the host and device code. Yes, yeah, so this is important. Just it's it's all C++. So the host is generally the CPU and it is used to dispatch the parallel execution of kernels. So this host device kind of, um, it, it controls or it's the, your standard kind of CPU serial um, device that, uh, yeah, it's your, the, the, the standard CPU, I suppose, uh, execution, you know, model executor thing. That, that's a bit of a random way, way of saying it, but yes. Uh, the device then is your accelerator, um, your offloading uh, processor, like a GPU, like a, an FPGA, like um, whatever that might be. Um, so the runtime library uh, schedules and it executes work. Okay, so this library here. So it loads kernels, um, it uh, dispatches them to whatever uh, offloading device you're using. Um, and it schedules the, the runtime. So it schedules which kernel should be dispatched at which time and um, so on. And it tracks dependencies between kernels, between uh, kernels or operations like mem copies, um, this kind of thing. Um, okay, so host device. So this uh, typically was something that was in the SQL spec for SQL 1.2. It's no longer actually in the spec but it's still there um, for DPC++ at least. This is kind of a, so we can decide to run our code using the host device, which is the, the CPU device. So you can interchange these devices, which is great uh, for debugging. Certainly this is really, really useful, but uh, this is kind of provided by the implementation or not, it's not necessarily a core language feature anymore. Uh, so this is a, a, a great thing for debugging, but, um, once your code is working on the host, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to then work on, you know, an offloading device. So you need to also uh, debug sometimes, well, usually on the, um, the device in question as well. Okay, and then the backend interface. So this is where the SQL runtime calls down into a particular backend in order to execute on a particular device. So for DPC++, this is called the plugin interface. And it's just, it, it talks to the, the CUDA driver. Um, so DPC++ uses the, the CUDA driver API um, and the plugin interface talks to it, sends kernels, builds kernels, sends them off, and then, you know, awaits for response and that kind of thing. Uh, yes. And then the device compiler is uh, kind of separate. So this would generate in the case of the CUDA backend, it generates PTX, which is the CUDA, um, CUDA assembly. And it also generates um, a, a CUDA uh, binary, um, which it puts into the final um, executable. We'll, we'll cover this again uh, later. Okay, so our standard C++ compilation model, uh, when you usually compile your normal code or whatever, this is kind of glossing over a few things, but in general, you get your C++ source, you compile it into an object, then you link it, and then this is linked into, with multiple objects or uh, potentially, yeah, uh, maybe static libraries or something. And then um, you, this is bundled into some executable, uh, and then you give it to the CPU, whatever, runs it. Okay, so the question is, how do we do this for uh, both the CPU and an offloading device. So in this case, where we have our device code, which is embedded within the source code, you know, as, a, as an element of it, uh, what do we do? So it's important to note, we'll uh, go over this a few times um, over the course of this workshop. So usually these are function objects, as in the kernels, the kernels are function objects. 
or lambda expressions. Okay, so uh, uh, by the way, this is phrased um, uh, maybe unfortunately, but it's not a standard function. Uh, forget std function. It's a function object or a lambda expression. It can't be a std function. Um, okay, and yeah, so let's see how this works. So the SQL device compiler produces device IR, which in the case of uh, CUDA is PTX. Um, okay. I, and the default, actually, the default is Spear V. So this is a, a device IR that can be consumed by OpenCL devices. Um, but when we're dealing with CUDA, as we are today, uh, it produces PTX. If we tell it to, we need to tell it to, as we'll see. Then this device IR is linked um, with the CPU object, and then you have a, an embedded device IR within this um, kind of executable uh, binary, and then uh, you can dispatch it, and then it'll split it up and run it at runtime. Okay. Um, yeah, so the idea is that you have these kind of like independent uh, compilation streams that it's only when they're linked together you need to kind of bring them back together. Um, yeah, so now DPC++ for CUDA. So we're gonna be talking a little bit more specifically about what DPC++ does with uh, the CUDA backend. So DPC++ is the one API uh, SQL compiler. Device and host code is written in the same C++ file. So that could be anything, you know, like whatever CC, CPP, et cetera. So um, I'm not sure if everyone has had the chance to um, load the module on Perlmutter or if you have access. Um, but the first thing that we can do uh, is just to check that our install is working. So I'm going to go over to my Perlmutter tab. Okay. So here you can see that, I'm not sure if that's big enough. So SQL LS is, um, this is, you know, the first kind of thing that we should use when we're checking what devices are available. Is the, um, the DPC++ kind of installation, is it working? Um, I, yeah, actually, sorry for, oh, sorry. I might just, um, so this is the command or the commands that we need to uh, run in order to load the module. Um, I'll maybe, is this in the general, I might post this in the Slack if everyone has, or Brandon's just uh, posted it in the Slack. Thank you, Brandon. Yeah, we can put that in the Slack and I think it's yeah. also on the, the readme for the, the repo that people will be using as well, so yeah. yeah. Okay, so essentially, SQL LS, this will tell us uh, what devices are available. Okay, so we have RA100, and we also have a host device. Okay, so these are the devices that we can choose from. Okay, so we can see that there's a kind of, we have a few um, different kind of, um, there, it's like a, a device triple, I suppose. So we have X, one API CUDA, uh, GPU and then zero. This is as in this is the the first device of this particular of the first you know two um, entries. Uh, you have host, which is you know host as well, and it's the first host. It, some SQL implementations have multiple hosts, but yeah, we don't need to worry about that. Um, yeah. Okay. So to use a DPC++ compiler, so we compile device code to spear v. This is the default uh, using just fsql. We're not necessarily interested in that at the moment. We're interested in compiling for the CUDA backend. So this will generate PTX and also PTX binary. Um, so if we do this, will that copy for me nicely? So let's see. And then we'll just do test. Let's see. see. Okay. Yeah, as we said earlier, um, so compiling is okay, but um, running code should be done uh, using sbatch. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure 
if I'm allowed to do that, if I'm above this law, maybe, yes. <laughs> um, so you're running on this device, okay? And actually uh, a really uh, neat thing that we can do to change the device that's selected by the runtime is use sickle device oh, filter is equal to, let's say CUDA a.out. Okay, so it's running on that. Yeah, great. Okay. Let's see. So we know that our sickle ls tells us that we have two devices. We have the host device and the um, the A100. So that's that's all that we can do really. Okay, so that's success. That's great. Okay, let's see what it looks like if we compile and we forget this flag and we compile for spear v, which cannot be consumed by um, by our CUDA device. Let's just see what kind of an error we get. Okay, so let's just say a dot out. So we know that actually, when you run this um, without specifying which device should be chosen, it seems that the default is the CUDA device. Okay, so we run this and then, oh, what happens? Okay, so terminate called after throwing an instance of a uh, single runtime error. So we have invalid binary. Okay, so that's essentially saying that spear v was passed to the CUDA device and then the CUDA device can't, you know, eat that. So um, yeah, you can't do that. So we need to make sure that we're compiling for the, the correct backend all the time. Okay, um, yeah, we can also uh, specify the arch. Okay, so uh, I didn't specify the arch there. Okay, so that actually means that the, the binary that was compiled was specific to SM50. Okay, so that's the default. The default is SM50. If I want it to be SM80, I need to specify it. Okay, so under the hood, what's happening? So essentially this is the same thing you have. This is um, parallel kind of compilation uh, streams. So this is obviously GPC++ for CUDA. So you have your CPU object, which uh, gets produced by your host compiler. And then the device compiler produces PTX assembly. And actually ahead of time, the PTX assembler is also invoked to create a CUDA object file. And then the CPU object, the PTX assembly and the CUDA object is lumped into this final fat binary. Um, and this is great. So essentially when, when we're running our fat binary, our runtime says, or at least the CUDA driver says, okay, is this PTX compatible? Uh, sorry, is this CUDA object compatible with my compute capability? And if not, then the PTX assembly uh, will be JIT compiled uh, into an appropriate binary at runtime. Um, so this essentially means we don't really need to worry about the arch flags that much. So like what was happening here when I was, um, when I was running uh, without having specified the arch, didn't specify the arch. So actually there was a device binary that was passed to the CUDA device. The CUDA driver took it and said, oh, actually I can't use this, but it doesn't matter because I, I have the PTX as well. I'm gonna JIT compile this into SM80, um, which is what's needed for the A100. Uh, and then I can still run the code. Um, and the PTX JIT compiler as well uses a cache. So the first time you, that you run it, um, the, the JIT, the JIT will, will happen, but the second time, third time, whatever, you'll just use the binary that was cached by the, the PTX JIT compiler. Um, this is great. It makes our life easy, but in fact, the PTX JIT compiler has a, um, a finite amount of time that it's given to JIT compile because uh, essentially you want your code to run quickly. Whereas the, the PTX assembler um, has a theoretically like, well, not finite amount of time that uh, it can use to do various optimizations, whatever. So it might happen that offline compilation, which is guaranteed by using the correct, the correct arch flags, it might happen that um, the PTX assembler gives you a little bit more optimal code, but like 
these things are very marginal. So you need to you need to profile, you need to test a little bit. Uh, if you wanted to test, if you wanted to test the PTXJ compiler versus offline PTX assembler, um, you would just pass the correct art flags for offline compilation or the incorrect art flags for JIT compilation, which is a bit a bit kind of hacky, but that's that's how it works. Um, yeah, okay. So yeah, there are a lot of things going on here. Like this is kind of an abstraction as well. We're just focusing on a few elements, but uh, you can query exactly what's happening uh, under the hood by passing the hash 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 flag. So let's have a look at that. So if I just do clone my signal, then I do hash hash hash. Okay, this will tell me all of the compilation subprocesses that are kind of that that happen as soon as I compile anything. Okay, so that's a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of stuff. So if I redirect that, okay, okay, so I'm gonna need to. We don't necessarily need to, uh, you don't need to read all of this, but there's a lot of stuff happening here, okay? So occasionally useful, certainly in our work, we're trying to figure out, you know, what's happening, what's going wrong in various compilation processes. So we use this all the time for day-to-day -day use. Um, if you're just implementing things in SQL, maybe not that useful, but good to know that it's there. Um, for instance, if you look, the PTX assembler. So this is where the PTX assembler is invoked. And we can see that it's for SM50. Okay. Because I didn't specify a, a code arch. Okay. Okay. Another really useful thing to kind of figure or to, to get um, intermediate files from the compilation process, which can be really, really useful, especially if you're trying to say compare PTX generated by DBC++ versus PTX generated by say NVCC, um, this can be, this is really neat if you want to do it, um, is use save temps. This needs to be called from within an empty directory. Um, so let's have a look at that. Okay, so uh, I think temp was full previously. Okay, so I'll just make the temp. Yes, yeah, so you need to make an empty directory, go into it, and then essentially, oh, sorry, I'll this up again. Um, okay, so we're going to save temps. And I'll need to provide a path to the test file. Okay, so this was an empty directory. And now, Okay, so we can see that, yeah, we got our a.out. out. We also got um, all of our intermediate files. Okay, so things like, let's just say for the host code, we got our, our pre-processed file. We got our bit code, uh, LLVM, bit code or byte code, I always mix these up. Um, we also have our x86 assembly. Uh, uh, so that's just for host code. So we, we have all this for host codes, footers, headers, uh, so on. Fat bins, yes, very nice. Um, and then for the, the CUDA, the CUDA backend, we have our CUDA object, we have our CUDA bit code. So we can see actually the, the PTX has passed through this LLVM layer uh, beforehand. So we've done LLVM optimizations on the, on the device code as well before we actually um, turn into PTX. And then the PTX gets optimized again. So theoretically, you know, it's being optimized by two separate things. So theoretically, it might be more optimal, who knows. Um, uh, we also have, so we're interested in our PTX, which is usually in a .s file. So we'll, let's open this up and see what's there. Now it's not every day that you'd necessarily be using this. Okay, so here's our uh, PTX, um, target blah, blah, blah. Can be really useful if you're trying to benchmark things, uh, compare, performance between say CUDA and DPC++. Um, for normal use, maybe overkill, but uh, good to know that you have these things as well. If you think that there are bugs that uh, are due to a particular process in the backend, you can get your PTX file, pass it to 
PTX assembler manually and you know figure out if if uh, something is working, not working, etc. Okay, so specifying the device at runtime. So this is just using our single device filter as we saw. Okay, and then that's everything for this slide. Questions? Can you repeat the one for uh, the flag for uh, requesting the specific CUDA architecture? Yes, 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 of course. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's, it, there, there are actually two flags. So you need to do Xicle target backend, and then CUDA GPU arch uh, is equal to SM whatever. So for A100, it's SM80. Okay, so actually, if we do. Um, so let's just do our previous. Um, so our last um, PTX was for SM50 because we didn't specify the thing, the, the architecture. But if we do X sickle target backend, uh, ooh, target. And then this is CUDA GPU arch is equal to SM80. Okay, we'll save temps and we'll see what the um, what the the PTX is like, and it should say SM eighty. We'd imagine. So let's just see. Okay, so this is a whole new set of things. Okay, SM eighty, very nice. Okay, so again, whether we want that, whether we want uh, our device binary to be um, produced ahead of time or at runtime by the, the JIT, JIT compiler, that's up to you. Um, I think, yeah, probably performance differences would be, you know, marginal to say the least. Okay. Um, any other questions? I have one stupid question. Um, can SQL be used with Fortran? Not a stupid question at all. Um, can SQL be used with Fortran? SQL is um, used essentially as a, we, we, we rely on C++ language features. So it is, um, it's, it sits completely on top of C++. It's a part of C++. The only thing that makes it different is essentially the back end, how it interacts with, um, you know, whatever uh, back end you might be targeting. So it is a purely C++ language. Uh, you can't, there, there isn't a, a Fortran API for a SQL. Um, but yeah, maybe. So, I, I, I could probably jump into yeah, a little Gordon, bit as well. Yeah. This is something that we've kind of talked about before and while SQL doesn't, have any kind of direct interoperability with, with Fortran. And um, SQL does provide uh, what's called like a, a host task, which is a feature where you can run um, arbitrary C++ code within the, the SQL DAG and scheduling DAG. And then from there, uh, you could potentially uh, invoke, uh, like sort of interoperate with, with Fortran code to sort of like standard sort of um, C ABI interoperability. So while it's not something that SQL provides, there is a potential route there. Um, I can I've not seen people do it before, but you know we've talked about it being theoretically possible. I think uh, Igor is, has a hand up. Uh, yes, I have essentially uh, two questions. First is, if I have an existing pure C++ application. Could I just compile it with, uh, let's say, the SQL compiler and hope it will just work, even though it will just work on the C uh, on the CPU? Yeah, yeah. Like if if you have uh, CPU code, you can you, you're you're just using Clang, um, or you're using like the the LLVM infrastructure. So you don't need to use like SQL necessarily. You can just use it as a C plus plus compiler and, and it'll work. But it it won't. It it'll purely work on the CPU in the exact same way that it would work with any other yeah, yeah. compiler. Yeah, it's fine. It's just when you want to port stuff, you want first to start with something that works. 
without any changes and move from there on. So I was just wondering if I can do that. And it looks like the answer is yes, which is great. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Maybe this was partially answered before, but uh, if I wanted to interface with something like uh, CUDA FFT, uh, is that doable, reasonable? Yes, absolutely, yeah. So um, SQL and DPC++ as well um, offers like a lot of interoperability APIs uh, whereby you can essentially write native CUDA code. And uh, we're not gonna be covering that today. It's a little bit out of the scope, but this is something that's completely possible with um, with SQL, with with DPC++ as well. You could, yeah, you can write completely native CUDA code in these kind of interop um, tasks, which is yeah very very natural. So this is a really easy way to port CUDA code into SQL code, and then maybe slowly uh, modify them to kind of more SQL leaning things. Thanks. Yeah, I can, I can point you to. Uh... To an example of, of how that's done, there's a GitHub repo with some examples that we could point you to. Now, following on a little bit from that as well, that, um, as well as DPC++, One API also provides uh, a series of libraries, so things like OneDNN, OneMQL, um, and I think there's there is one coming from for One FFT. Um, I think that's not so. We're we're also working to try and support these with. Uh, CUDA backend as well. So it, the, the QFT isn't available yet, but that's kind of in the roadmap for the future. So something to, to look out for. Uh, hi, this is Bryce Allen from Argon. Uh, are there plans to support uh, multiple GPU backends there? So if you're wrapping QFT, would it also work with uh, one API MKL? I guess you don't have an AMD back yet, but at least for Intel. Yeah, so I think the, so these libraries all all like they have backends for uh, Intel platform, and we're uh, we're working on supporting these for the the CUDA backend. So far, there's there's a good amount of support for one MKL. Um, and one DNN, we're actually in the process of adding additional support for one DNN. Um, okay. And then we've got kind of we're, we, we're kind of keen to support some of the other libraries like the QFT and uh, QDPL, uh, sorry, um, one DPL, one FT. Um, so these are all kind of planned for the future, but um, not available just yet. Um, and obviously, it would be it'd be good to have these supported on on the, the AMD platform as well. But I think that'll be a little bit further in the future. Um, I actually have written a thin wrapper around all of the, it, it also supports AMD, so it supports Intel, uh, CUDA, and, and AMD Rockdown platform for a subset of Blast and SSD uh, that we needed for our application. So I guess if anyone else needs something now, um, you can take a look at what we've done. It, it's on GitHub. Uh, under G Tensor, uh, our, we also have a multi-dimensional library, but the, the li library wrapper is largely orthogonal to that. Uh, so I, uh, I'm actually driving right now, but I can post the link to the chat later if anyone is interested. Uh, I have a question regarding how the sickle queue maps to a CUDA stream behind the scenes. So currently, so theoretically, a single queue doesn't have to necessarily have a relationship to a CUDA stream. But so in, in certain implementations, not, notably HipSicle, uh, a queue maps to a collection of streams, meaning that you can essentially have uh, a queue executing uh, concurrently, uh, which is the goal. Um, but currently, uh, it is actually mapping directly to a single stream, but that is liable to change. The compiler that you just maps to one, one to one, is that correct? That is correct, Gordon, am I, am I correct? That, that's correct? That's right, yeah. So at, at the moment, in DPC++, the, the queue is a one-to-one -one mapping with CUDA stream. Um, but as you mentioned, we, we may be looking to kind of expand that um, 
in the future to kind of allow for more parallelism in the, in the scheduler. Thank the you. moment is a one-to-one. -one. Cool. Okay, yeah, so maybe we might go into the first exercise. So the first yeah. exercise. I've, sorry, I, hear, uh, I was just gonna yeah, jump in. I've, I've posted the, um, the links on the Slack channel, so everyone should be able to get them there, but I'll, yeah, I'll let you um, talk through how the, how this example works, yeah. So for yes, so you need to clone the um, the civil academy repo and make sure that you're on um, yeah Pearl Motor Workshop, <clears throat> and then we'll go to code exercises. Uh, oh, sorry, exercise here one. Okay, so essentially we just want to. Um, make sure that our we're, we're able to compile with the single header essentially um so we want to include the header uh default construct queue so this we don't necessarily need to think too hard about this at the moment see what device is associated with that queue and then so this is a string um you'll be getting the info of the device's name and then maybe um uh maybe uh, printing that out or something just so that we know what uh, device that we have chosen. Um, so yeah, uh, essentially copy this into our file and then we can see how it runs uh, and hopefully use sickle device filter to specify the device and um, see how that changes which device is chosen. Okay. So we have the solutions thing. So I would recommend um, not to look at the solutions before um, trying the exercise yourself, but um, it's, it's a free free world. So yeah. Uh, so this is just a simple example of what you might use. Um, default constructing a queue, get the device, get the dev name, and then chosen device. Um, if people are having issues that um, obviously this is very simple code. So uh, if you're having issues with this sort of code, then we need to make sure that um, that uh, we figure with, with a dot out. Okay, sorry, okay. Um, yeah, we need to make sure that we figure out any issues now before we get on to more complex things. Uh, yeah, does anyone have any questions about this solution? Um, can we get a link to the SQL documentation, the API documentation? Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. Um, you can post it in Slack, so it's there forever. Yeah, maybe. I'll, um, so there's the SQL spec and also the, the one API um, kind of, you know, spec as well. So I find that the SQL spec is very good. Um, Okay, so this is the spec. Um, so I think potentially um, um, someone was having an issue with uh, could error out of memory. I'm not sure if this is got to do with not using a batch script. If if this is the kind of error that you might be susceptible to if many people are trying to run with a dot out. Maybe this is something that happens. Um, so, uh, do we have um, do we have uh, a reference kind of s batch that is somewhere in the Slack or or so that we could uh, direct people to? Yeah, I think there was something on the original. Um... Uh, deck that was shared. Um, maybe not full script. Uh, let me let me dig out because I, I find something uh, that I do. There are some instructions I think on the, the NERSC documentation. I can try and look at. Um, this is coming from a CUDA programmer, so uh, 
do we need to uh, clean up the queue structure or it's automatically allocated because this is C++? No, it's, it's, it's automatically, um, yeah, just default constructor, totally fine. Okay, so it's not like you have to manually uh, could I destroy something something uh, when using SQL. No, 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 no. So this is yeah. Again, uh, C plus plus has its own destructors. Um, yeah. Awesome. So uh, yeah, the the C plus plus paradigm is a good rule of thumb. Um, so if something works usually in C plus plus, same for SQL. Cool. Okay. Um, yeah, I might crack on to the next um, exercise. Maybe a quick question because somebody asked on the Slack, what is the status of the host, uh, host backend? Is this enabled? Can I do a CPU selector or it is disabled on uh, on this backend? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's enabled. So, so uh, query your SQL LS. Um, I'm not sure, am I still sharing my screen? Can people see my screen? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Right. The the Zoom thing is kind of disappeared. Okay. Um. Yeah. So query your your SQL LS and you'll see uh what's available. So you can. So the the way that I think um is nice to specify the runtime device is using uh or sorry SQL device filter is using SQL device filter and we can say host if you essentially use any of the words. That are used in any of these triples then it'll select the one that matches um so in this case a dot out running on sql host device success okay we can also do uh, cuda okay and then that was invalid binary for the the because i compiled with spear beak but uh, i would recommend using sql device filter is equal to cuda there are other ways of um constructing queues where uh, you statically choose what kind of a device that you want, um, and this is this is good as well. But again, uh, we don't have a well. This this is outside the scope of today's um, workshop. But there there are lots of materials online where you can see how to do this. Um, it's very very simple. It's just that we do have a finite amount of time today. Uh, does that uh, uh, but... sorry to interrupt you so here we, we need to specify uh, ext underscore one api underscore coda uh, yeah it, it turns filter, right? it turns out that just coda is actually fine J just coda uh, what about the full full name can can what about can you type the full name here yeah we can you you don't need to type the full name essentially i i'm not sure exactly um how this is matching but anything that um uh any word that will match here um in this triple will specify the right device okay you could also do single device filter gpu um this is a bad example because it's failing because it's going to the the CUDA device yes yeah, because uh, um, because i think for most users they probably don't know, don't know that you need to specify some some device filter before they run the binary code so so yeah so that's i think it's good for for people to 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 be up to, to to realize that we need to have um a filter to to, to run for to run the program that's very different from what people would do with CUDA running CUDA or hip program yeah so the 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 reason this is it's not actually essential. You can decide what device runs in the code, but um, essentially this is, as I see it, a benefit of uh, SQL because you can determine which device things run at at runtime. You don't need to change any code to run it on different devices. Uh, I think this is a, a, a this is this is a, a, a trick, if you like. This is something that will enhance the usability of your code, whereas you could actually you can hard code these things in your code using, um, <clears throat> okay, just for, for instance, I'll go to, uh, sorry. So, okay, so hello, Seco. Okay, so if I wanted to, okay, I'm not gonna try and run this code, but um, 
if I wanted to, I could. You can essentially tell the uh, the queue what device you want it to be constructed with. Okay, so here we're going to use a GPU <coughs> selector. Okay, great. So that'll only run with the GPU. Okay, mm -hmm. so let's see what happens actually uh, when you see include our header. Okay. Okay, so let's see. So we'll do uh, nine plus plus. Maybe we'll see if there's something decent. Nine plus plus. Okay, so <coughs> just as a very, very basic example. Okay, so we'll do um, a source CPP. Mm. So this is just constructing a queue. It's not doing anything else. Okay. So if we run it with a.out, success. Okay, it, it constructs. Okay. If we specify the the device at runtime as host. <coughs> okay. No device requested type available. Okay, device not found. Okay, so in fact, if you use your standard your default constructor for a queue then you have far more flexibility at runtime because you can choose things okay you can choose if you wanted to run on this device that device that device whereas this will only allow you to run it on a gpu and that's that might be desirable that might um it depends on what you're doing if you're trying to prototype debug um it's very very useful very dynamic to be able to swap between host and uh other devices very quickly, but um, yeah, and there, there, are, there are lots of different uh, selectors. You can also do host selector, <coughs> CPU selector, host selector, these kind of things. So, so, so okay. to rec oh, I see it's a good idea. So, you're, it is, so you recommend that uh, we just specify a generic queue without, spe oh, we specify a queue without specifying the selector, and then we can. Uh, use the device filter to run a, a program on, on, on a specific device. Uh, I see. Yeah. It, it's, cer it's certainly up to the user. Um, like, it, it, I, this is how I use Sickle, and I find that this is really, really helpful. Um, but it's, it's up to the user. I see. Okay. Thanks. Anyway, I'm, you're welcome. <laughs>